Okay, let's say we're gonna go back to your high school, Virginia Beach, and you are going to have a five minute powwow with some students on the first steps of making a movie. What would you tell them? When I was making shorts with my friends when I was 17, 18, I was having fun. I mean, it was work, but it didn't, you don't think of it that way. Nobody did, I don't think. So you should have fun and you should, you know, think of an idea or something that you means something to you personally that's, that's different, not just, a, you know, because a lot of young filmmakers, they just imitate other movies that they've seen. They do their own version of that. And I did things like that too. Hmm. But I think if you're going to like really put some effort into something nowadays, you know, maybe try to think of an idea, a storyline, a little short story that you know, has some kind of meaning to you personally. It doesn't have to be the most like biggest heavy theme in the world, but just something that means something to you. And also try to do something simple and start off with something simple. Uh, because if you try to do a bigger thing right off the bat, it's, it's gonna, you know, it could turn into a mess. So I think, you know, and, and usually the really, the really good short films, the best ones, I'm talking about like the top of the, you know, they're usually fairly, simple with a lot, not too many characters and a fairly straightforward story and some kind of a surprise at the end, some kind of a twist at the end, you know, that kind of stays in your mind. So those are some of the things I would say. I mean, I, I just think you, but I think you should have fun doing it. I think that's, that's very important. Don't worry too much about the technical aspect of it. I think, um, you know, you, you will learn that over time if you're serious about it, if you're in, and you might even have other people doing those, those jobs. Um, but initially, I think you should just think more about conveying something original, you know, idea-wise, I would say. And then would it be the same if it was for features? Let's say you're speaking to a group of high school students who've been making short films since they were like eight, mm -hmm. and so now they're ready to make this leap. Uh -huh. Would it be the same? Or any other advice? Jeez, you know, it, it's, it's funny. I mean, like the first feature I did, I was 17 when I directed. It was a vampire hitman movie called Bad Blood. And it was just so influenced by, you know, John Woo's The Killer and, you know, probably some horror movies I was watching at the time. And so it wasn't the most original thing in the world. Uh, and it was biting, we were definitely biting off a lot more than we could chew. We had all these big action scenes and effects and stuff. So it would be tough for me to tell people don't do that. You know, like it's, it'd be tough for me to tell people don't be ambitious with your feature because I don't know. I feel like a lot of the a lot of major filmmakers who start off making shorts and things like that, they were pretty ambitious with their projects. So I don't know. I mean, I think you I think it does just boil down like the short film. It kind of boils down to, to coming up with an idea that you're really passionate about and a story you're really passionate about and something you feel realistically you can achieve, you know, with your resources that you have. But it's always good to push a little bit more beyond that. Like, I still do that now. Like, anytime I come up with an idea for something I want to make, I always think to myself, okay, what are we, what resources do we have? Okay, great. Now let's push another 10%, another 20%, how much, 30, however much percent we can push it. Because I feel like if you're not doing that, then you're not challenging yourself enough. You're not like, that's, to me, that's the excitement is always pushing beyond, a bit beyond your budget, beyond your resources. Because um, then you come up with cool, creative things sometimes, like cool, creative um, solutions for those things. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's what I would say. Interesting, because do you think, has it always been, been in you to not play it safe, or were you always groomed to play it safe? I might have been groomed to play it safe, but I don't think I did. I mean, if, if, I mean, if I did, I wouldn't make any movies. I wouldn't pick up a camera and even bother with it. And because these things were definitely not safe. I mean, sometimes there were literal safety issues, you know, with where we're, you know, trying to do gunfights and we're setting off firecrackers, you know, using firecrackers as squibs. And, you know, we, we, we got, you know, taken home by the cops more than a few times, you know, we we're filming these things and kicked out of locations. And um, we didn't get arrested or booked, but just, close to that, as close as you can get to that. Uh, so no, I was definitely not playing it safe. And, and, I, and I've always had this in, you know, mentality, and sometimes it's got me into trouble, where I'll go into something that's very low budget, and in my mind, it's some big $100 million movie. 
Like my mind, you know, I'll be making a movie for a million dollar movie and my mind is like aliens, you know, or something that's a hundred million. Why can't we just do that? Why can't we just do that stuff? Well, because we don't have the money. I don't want to hear that. I just want to try to do something with that level of intensity and, and everything. So it's, it's uh, I've always kind of been like that. I always kind of push beyond the boundaries, I think, in terms of the, the resources and stuff. Um, that's to me, that's the fun of it, you know. Going back to Paul Schrader, I know we were just having fun talking yeah. about it off camera, but you were just, you had something to say about just his work and being appreciated. Well, I think what the, okay, I'm a huge Paul Schrader fan. I've been a fan since I discovered his work uh, while I was in film school. And I'm a fan of not just the movies he's written, but the movies he's directed, which are the ones that people, I think, really need to see. The uh, first Reformed, he got his first Oscar nomination for First Reformed this past, you know, uh, Oscars, and he didn't win. But I was number one surprised that that was the first Oscar nomination he'd ever received for considering he's written, you know, movies like Taxi Driver and Raging Bull. I was, I was, I consider my myself a straighter expert, and I thought he had at least been nominated for those movies. My point, though, where I was thinking, you know, was this thing about First Reformed, which was on a lot of critics' top ten lists and all that is you never, you never really count anybody out. You know, Paul Schrader is someone who I think has been counted out more than once in his career. I think he's been, I don't wanna say the butt of jokes, but I think he's definitely been, you know, downgraded, not really appreciated as a filmmaker. And even re recently, especially, with some of the stuff that he directed. And I think it's just great that he made that film. It's very much of a Schrader film. It's very pure Schrader um, movie. And even if I didn't like it as much as some of his other work, I still just was so happy to see that. And I think it just proves that nobody's ever out. You know, no filmmaker is ever retired or done because you never know what they might come up with next. That's a good point. So that's what I, yeah, and that's really what I thought. I mean, and other people did too, you know. And when you had friends that went to film school that kind of said like, I wouldn't do that or don't do that or that's stupid or why would you, did, was that sort of in your mind just seeing how someone's work or someone can be doubted at first mm. and underappreciated? Do you think you? I think, I've, I think I've reached the point because I've been directing now for 20 plus years. I've reached the point that, you know, I've had my own ups and downs just like a lot of other filmmakers. And it puts you, it gives you a perspective on things. And you, you are more, you, you are more understanding of those type of like ups and downs and shifts that every filmmaker has in their career. So like the thing with Schrader, you know, to me it was just sort of like a nice proof. It happens with actors a lot sometimes, but you don't see it as much with like directors or writers, you know, sometimes you'll, you know what I mean? That kind of, that kind of thing, that kind of rebirth or that kind of revitalized thing. Sometimes you'll, you know, see that, but, um, no, I don't know. I just, I just think that I'm not, I'm not regretful of any, <laughs> anything, you know what I mean? I think people, it's easier for people to make fun of stuff sometimes when they're, you know, they're not doing it or whatever. It's always easier. It's always easier to not make a movie than to make a movie. <laughs> you yeah. know. And it's interesting how the crowd turns can turn on somebody who can have like three great movies in a row, and man, they do one movie. It's uh, not even that it's like a oh, horrible yeah. subject matter, and then people oh, are so angry. Well, at two that of my two of my favorite directors, <laughs> William Friedkin and Peter Bogdanovich. That's exactly what happened to both of them. I mean, Friedkin on an even bigger level because he had you know. French Connection, The Exorcist, and you know, you don't get bigger and more popular than those films. Uh, then he did Sorcerer, which everyone just loved to hate, even though it's not a bad film. In fact, I think it's his best film. And a lot of people have come around, and he considers it his best film too, by the way. But a lot of people consider that his best work or definitely one of his best movies. And I think people are just looking for him to fail. Like they're kind of wanting him to fail at that point. Like, okay, buddy, you've had your turn. You're done now. You know, that's, that's, that's how I perceived it. Bogdanovich is the same with, you know, uh, with uh, Last Picture Show and What's Up Doc and all that. And then he, you know, kind of they couldn't wait to sort of, you know, have this big downward. I'm, and I'm not, look, I'm not saying that all everything, you know, all these, everything they directed was brilliant. But there is this, there is a tendency, yeah, to kind of like put somebody way up on a pedestal and then tear them down, way down, uh, way, way lower than they, than they deserved, you know. 
Yeah, it seems like that's part of almost some career paths, and then there's a rebuilding and a rebirth, but it has yeah. to be like years later. Different people. I mean, like, you know, like I was mentioning Friedkin, he's another one that, you know, he's some of the films he's made lately, and I think he's in his 80s now, or late 70s or 80s, are some of his best films. I mean, I thought Bug was a tremendous movie, and it's a very small movie, you know, and, and uh, I thought Killer Joe was really good. And these are like recent films that he directed. And he's had a lot of peaks and valleys. I actually find filmmakers like that a lot more interesting than like directors like, sorry, but people like Spielberg, who are pretty much coasting along. And yeah, sure, he's got some ups and downs, but like he's never been vilified the way some of these other filmmakers were talking about. And you know, he's never had probably such box office you know, losses and, and, you know, incredible, and he's never worked on such a small level either, like a, a movie like Bug or, um, or Killer Joe or something like that, you know, so I just, I find directors like that more interesting, I think. A lot of my favorite filmmakers are kind of eccentric and they're not mainstream, necessarily. Very few, actually, are mainstream, you know.